Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we look into your word, we ask that you open our hearts to your wisdom, to your truth, to your understanding, and speak to us, Lord, that we can hear all that you have to say. And thank you that uh, you work in us to ever change us, to be more holy, to be more righteous, and to be more like yourself. So bless this time together that we have in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this world we're living in is becoming more evil. Um, I can't imagine people saying that they need to make it a law that you can uh, murder babies uh, up to four weeks after they're born. And they even have uh, writing in this California law that it could go up to two years. Um, it's evil. This is satanic. Satan has always loved killing babies. He tried to drown all the Hebrew boys. He wanted the midwives to kill them. And um, he had the god Moloch where they would offer their newborn children uh, to that piece of metal. And uh, all of the crime we're seeing in the world when the world uh, in this country lets out criminals when they should not be left out. And then they go out and kill people. And they say, well, this is the reason we need to take the guns away from the citizens. Uh, this is an evil world we live in that are putting people out there to do crimes. And uh, we do have access to the whole country, to the whole world on the Internet, so we can see what's happening all over the world. And um, it always has been happening. Sin. People are sinful. Um, when Adam and Eve sinned, their hearts became evil. Uh, this world was somewhat taken over by Satan. He's called the God of this world, the God of this age, uh, the ruler of the prince of the power of the air. Um, so people do follow him. We do have these awful sinful natures that are so wrong, and, and they hurt other people. And it's because of the sinful nature that people are being hurt now. And uh, we look at this global government that the Bible does predict is going to take place, and so we can see it happening. There are people in this world are putting it together, and from their own meetings and their own talks, um, they say that we're going to have a digital money. Maybe by the end of this year, President Biden has told his uh, different groups in government to work on it. Uh, a lady that is um, a counselor to presidents, as was her father, has stated that we are going to come up with a digital money, and it's on the brink, and it's happening, and it will be very soon. And it will be programmable. It won't be like money. It'll be different than money. You will have uh, what we earn will be put into this World Bank, and it will be programmable so that if we don't play well with globalism, that they will just restrict us and not allow us to use our own money. Um, and the Bible predicted that this would happen. That's the only way that somebody can control the buying and selling of the entire planet. So uh, we see evil happening. I heard um, a couple of pastors speaking la last week and they said that in their churches that maybe once or twice a year somebody would come to them with a problem of, of demon oppression or demon possession. But now they say it's weekly. Now they say several times a week people in the congregation or in the community are coming to them with problems that are very spiritual, uh, the, the um, oppression of, of demons. And before, when Jesus came, the demon possession was rampant, and he spent a lot of time every day casting out demons out of people. So uh, Satan knows this is his time, and this is his government, and he's going to be able to take over the entire world, every single person on it. There will be nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. It's all because of sin. Uh, when Adam and Eve were made, created, God made them. But at that time, nobody would ever become a doctor. There was no need for it. Nobody would ever have a need for a hospital. No nurses. They would ha never have a need of police. 
when Adam and Eve were first made. There was no need for anybody to have an army to protect, and there, there were no uh, bad drugs to mess up people's lives. There were no canes, you know, like a walking cane. Those weren't ever going to be there. There would never be a judge who, who would judge crime. There would never be a court. There would never be a lawyer. There would never be a jail or a prison. There would never be any neighborhood watches. There would be no locks. There would be no bars. And there will be no bars. <laughs> No bars on the window and no bars to get a drink. And there would be no fighting, no lying, no deception. There will never be anybody hurt and there would never be any pain. That's what God had planned. But then Adam and Eve became very self-centered and they chose to disobey God. And from then on, uh, the first couple of children of Eve, one is jealous of the other and Cain kills Abel. And then when God comes and calls him on it, he denies it and says, I don't know, I'm not that guy's keeper, you know. And, and he's all mad that probably God even approached him on it. Well, he got punished by God grievously, and God has to punish sin. God's, what God wants is, is to have a whole world again with no sin, nobody hurting each other, no trouble, no sorrow, no sadness, no guilt and pain and suffering. And eventually it will end up that way again. Every sinner that doesn't turn to Christ will be in the lake of fire for all eternity. They will never get out to hurt anybody. They will be hurt. There will be no Satan or demons to ever hurt anybody again. They will be uh, at one point locked up for a thousand years then finally thrown into the lake of fire. And we will live forever and ever in a beautiful world that God has made for us. And it will be so much more beautiful than the one we have now. And, and we'll be more beautiful. <laughs> we'll have perfect bodies and everybody will love one another. And uh, that's what God really wants. So um, he sent Christ as our Savior from our sin. It saves us from hell. And oh, that's very important. That's the most important decision we can make in this lifetime. When this lifetime's over, there's no other chance to make a decision to trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. And he also saves us from our sin nature that always wants to do evil, that always messes us up. And, and most of the problems we have in this life is because of our own sin nature or somebody else's sin nature. That's why the... Uh, kids can around the world. Uh, we we talk to different people and it's all the same, because all the Bible says sin is bound in the heart of a child. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod will drive it far from them. So that's why the world is making it against the law to use the rod. That's why you see these kids um, that are just acting just without out of control. Groups of teenagers around the world going and beating up people, stealing from people, killing people. In the end, it says that one of the big sins is going to be children killing their parents, striking their parents, disobeying their parents. All against God, and Satan's taken over, and you can sure tell. But Christ came to take away our sin. When a person becomes saved, Christ washes them from all of our sin, but he gives us a new nature. We're, we're born again. We have a new uh, something in us that we never had before. And the Holy Spirit comes into us. And the Holy Spirit is God living inside of us. And he will never leave us. He will never go away. For all eternity, it says he will be in us forever. So we have power not to mess up our lives. We have power not to be guilty. We have power not to be sorrowful that we sin. And we have power in us not to hurt other people, to love other people. Um, God made this earth very good. And when he makes us a new person in Christ, it's very good. I was uh, talking to one of my children the other day and, and who were, you know, have trouble from time to time because of sin. And I thought about this. I never thought about this before, that 
When I think back to Marymont, Marymont's the elementary school I went to in Sacramento. And I could just walk a couple of blocks and there I was. And I remember, I think, three names of teachers, just their last names. But I remember the principal's name, Ada L. Peck. And she was an elderly woman, and I'm sure uh, she'd be way into her hundreds by now. <laughs> she was still alive. But I remember her name. And the reason was because I spent more time in her office than I did in the classroom. <laughs> and I'm here to testify that God can change you. <laughs> he can change people and make them brand new. Um, so that they don't spend all their time in their principal's office. Now they end up teaching a class. Teaching a class about the Bible. God is interested in changing us. And he wants us from the day we're saved to keep growing and changing and becoming new people in Christ. To, um, he will just work on us little by little to the problems that we have. The old nature. He just makes them new. He, he tells the the thief, the person that used to steal, and then the person gets saved. And now he tells that person, you're going to change. You're not going to stay a thief. I want you to go out and get a job. And the money that you earn, I want you to take some of that money and give it to poor people. You're doing a whole 180 here. And that's the way God is. He takes people that, that were once sinners, that they could not help themselves, they had no self-control, and then his spirit comes in. He creates a new person, and he gives us self-control. He wants his church and his people to be holy and righteous. And to a large movement of churches around the world that are saying it's okay to sin, God loves you just the way you are. Uh, if, if you're a homosexual, God does not like homosexuals. Oh, he loves the person and not the sin. It's the person that is going to end up in hell, not the sin. It's the person. He loves us, and he died to pay for that sin, and he wants people to come to him and be changed and play the rules by God's rules, play by his rules. He's the one that sets up rules of what is wrong and what is right. Our sinful nature sets up the rules for us. <laughs> we make our own rules. You know, people will say, my God wouldn't do that. That's your trouble. It's your God. When, when you die, your God isn't going to be around. It's going to be the real God. He's the one that's really going to judge us. So God is interested in changing our behavior. And that's what this passage uh, this morning that we're going to look at, that's what it's talking about. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 20, it says this, but that is not the way you learn Christ. And why does he say that? Because right above that, he, he's saying that the unsaved person and us before we are saved, that all of our minds, all of our thinking was just futile. We are darkened in our understanding. We are alienated from the life of God. We were ignorant. Ignorance is and dwells within the unsaved. And we have hard hearts. And we have become callous. We have no sensitivity to people. And we've given themselves up to sensuality and we're just greedy to uh, practice every kind of impurity. And he says, but you haven't learned Christ that way. That isn't what you learned about Jesus. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. God wants us to change and wants us to grow. We're going to look at this passage with just two points and uh, the first one is, our new Christian life is based in Jesus Christ. And then the second one is, our new Christian life is a life of growth and change once we become saved. So, our, our new Christian life is, is a life based in Jesus Christ. He says in verse 20, um, you didn't learn Christ 
by living in all these sinful ways. That isn't the way you learn as a Christian. And in this, the context of the book of Ephesians, you know, the, the first three chapters talks about who we are, our position as a Christian. And then chapters four through six, the last three, talk about what he wants us to do, how he wants us to live now that we are a Christian. So we can see a, a change that comes in chapter two where the person is unsaved and then God comes into his life and then the person is saved. In chapter 2 and verse 1, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We lived in those. We followed the course of the world. We followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the sense of disobedience. We lived in the passions of our flesh. Whatever the body said it wants to do, do it. Seems like I remember uh, in the 60s, the hippie, you know, if it feels good, do it. Uh, that's just what that is. Uh, we carried out the desires of the body and the mind. But we were by nature, we were children of wrath. We were children of God's wrath. God is going to judge sin. Uh, and all mankind is in that situation. But in verse 4, here's these two wonderful words. But God... I remember people telling me when I was younger, my younger messed up days, you're, you don't have any hope. You're without hope. You, you'll never change. One of those was my own father used to tell me that. But God looks at a different, but God, but God being rich in his mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, that's, that's where the hope comes in. Even when we're dead, even when we're enemies of God, God comes into our life and he makes us alive together with Christ. We're saved by his grace. We don't deserve it, but he does that for us. And then you get down to verse 10 and it says that, that we're his workmanship. He's created us. He's the craftsman. He's the poet, and we're the poem. That's the actual word here for workmanship, poema. It's the word for poem. He writes the poem, and the poem is our lives. We are created in Christ Jesus. An actual creation takes place. And, we're, and it happens for good works, that we'll do good works. That's why. It says above that, we're not saved by good works, but it says after we're saved, we do good works because God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should live in our good works. And then if you go to chapter 4 where it begins the practical part and how to live now that we're believers, Paul says, I urge you to walk or to live in a manner worthy of your calling. He has called us to be sons of God and then he says, now live like a child of God. And then uh, later on, it says um, in verse 17, he says, I, Now this I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the fertility of their minds. Stop living your life like you used to. You need to change and become like Christ, a new way of life that he's given us. So, uh, he says we haven't learned Christ in that way because Christ isn't like that. Christ isn't a sinner. Christ never sinned, not once. And I find that hard to believe because I'm a sinner. <laughs> but he's not, and, and he never sinned as a child, never. And this word learn, you haven't learned Christ in that way. Um, in Matthew 9, 13, Jesus told uh, some people, he says, go and learn what that means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice because I came to call the righteous and the sinners. So he gave them a statement. He said, I want you to learn and find out what that means. And then in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and I'm lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He wants us to learn about him. One time he showed him a fig tree and tell, told them a parable about that. And he just says, learn the lesson. I want you to learn about what I'm saying. And in John 7, 15, he says, how is it that this man has learning 
and has never studied. They marveled. The religious leaders marveled and the people were just amazed at how Jesus spoke and what he said and the authority that he said it because he's God. He spoke as God. And they say, he has such learning, but he never went to school. We know he didn't go to any of our schools. Well, we need to learn from this man that people are amazed at how much he knew because he's God. Uh, he says, to continue in what you have learned, he told Timothy. And let the people learn to devote themselves to good works. That's what we're to be doing, to learn how to do that. So we learn about Jesus. Right before Jesus left, he said, teach the disciples to observe everything that I have commanded you. I've commanded you to do all these things. Teach them so people will learn. And we're learning about Christ, and it's not just learning facts and details about him. Uh, Christianity is a relationship where we know him personally. We know the true God, the creator of heavens and earth, personally. Uh, Paul said in Philippians 3.10, he says, I want to know him. I want to know him as a person. And we can do that. He wants us to do that every day to have a time when we come to him by ourselves, prefer preferably in the quiet of the hours uh, early in the morning or late at night or whatever works best. But to spend time with Jesus in his word, reading the Bible and learning all about him. And it's such a delight every day just to spend some time when uh, trouble comes in our life. When we're the trouble in our life, uh, we can go to Christ and say, you know, help me out with this and, and direct me. Put your words in my mind and my thoughts. And he'll do that and he'll direct you to scripture. And you can go read that scripture and say, thank you, Lord, for showing me what my problem is and what I need to do. He's, he's real. And when we pray to him, we go right into the throne room of God. So we can learn Christ. And when we learn Christ, we do understand that we're not to continue in our sin. Uh, he told the prostitute to go and sin no more. Her sins were forgiven, but go and sin no more. You need to change your job and get a new job. And in Christ, we can. Um, Paul used his own life as a testimony to the changing power of God. And he said, I used to persecute the church, but now I helped build the church. A total 180. When he got saved, uh, most of the disciples wouldn't trust him. They thought, oh, this guy's just saying that he's saved. He's going to come in and find out where we all are, then have us arrested. Or they, they were afraid of him. But they soon became to realize that, no, this guy really is preaching the gospel. From the time that he was saved probably that day when his eyes were open finally. Uh, he went proving from the scriptures that the Jesus of that time period was indeed the Christ, the Messiah that was promised from the Old Testament. And he was confounding the Jews, showing them, hey, he fulfilled all these prophecies. He is really God. He is our Messiah. He changed so dramatically. For he had a zeal at one time in his life for going after Christians and killing them, killing them. And then he became a Christian. He had a zeal to go after people and make them Christians and, and then to exhort the Christians to live a godly Christian life. So we come to the truth. We come to Christ and, and we, our lives changed. So when Paul describes the old way of living, he said, you didn't learn Christ that way. <laughs> My Bible has an exclamation point after the word Christ. That isn't how you learn Christ. And then he says, um, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. And we know that scripture, John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There's a lot of people screaming for our ears nowadays. They want our attention. And that's one reason I hate advertising. I've hated it for years. 
um, you're trying to watch a TV show, and every few minutes, here comes another commercial. And the commercials are really bad. Uh, you know, the last time I watched TV, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or something, I stopped watching TV. I, I do remember commercials when I was a kid, and, and they were kind of cute and fun, and they didn't show them very much. You know, old shows, a half-hour show, you could watch 25, 27, 28 minutes of the show, and just a couple of minutes were commercials. Uh, what was that one about Bucky, Bucky Beaver, I paint a toothpaste? Uh, where's the beef? I remember that one. You know, they were just cute things, but now they're just obnoxious and annoying and, and so manipulative. You don't know what in the world you're looking at or listening to their subliminal stuff and all this. So uh, politicians promise big things. And, and a politician says, I'm going to build back better. Well, he didn't tell us the part that that's the United Nations slogan that doesn't want America to be America anymore. He didn't tell us that part. Or tell us the reason we need to be built back is because the former president was doing a really good job. We were going gangbusters. And then they destroyed the, co the economy intentionally by lies and deception about a virus that we found out there were cures for, and they outlawed the cures to make it worse. And so they're destroying us, and then they say, well, we're going to build you back better, but it's not going to be better. It's a lie. They're going to end up controlling our lives and taking away all our freedoms. Isn't it nice to have somebody that says, I really am truth? I am actual truth. It's impossible for God to lie. And at the same time, it's impossible for Satan to tell the truth because Jesus said there is no truth in him. That's why these globalists can not tell the truth. That's all they do is lie. And, and more lies, just, they just keep coming. Jesus said, I'm the truth. We have um, heard about him. None of us have heard him, but we have sure heard a lot about him. The Ephesians people, they never saw Jesus, but they heard about him, and they were taught the truth in Jesus. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He was full of grace and truth. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, he is the word of truth. He said, I am the light of the world. Were you ever afraid of the dark when you were little? I was. There were, something was under my bed. It was probably the cat. But something was under my bed, and I was afraid of the dark. And um, I remember going, trying to go to my parents' bedroom because I was deathly afraid and trying to find the doorknob in the dark. And the longer it took me to find the doorknob, I thought I was more doomed, and I'd start panicking. And uh, I did not like the dark when I was a kid, and uh, I, well, I mostly grew out of it. I still don't like the dark. You know, in heaven, it's going to be light all the time. It'll never be dark. It'll never be night. There'll never be any locks on the doors. The gates will be open all the time. Hmm. So I don't like the darkness, but I love the fact that Jesus is the light. He lights up my soul. He shows me the truth. He shows me the truth of the Bible. He's so good, he's so powerful, he's so pure and, and righteous. And um, he's, he's saying to us, that's who you're putting your trust in. You're the one, um, Jesus, that I am modeling my life after. So this is this Christ, this Christ that we learn about, this Christ that we've heard, this Christ that we're taught about. He is the truth. So our feet are on solid ground when we follow him on more solid ground than anything this world has to offer. Because this world only offers sandy soil that when the flood of death comes and hell is there waiting, uh, you won't make it. But if we have our trust in Jesus Christ, we will. So now he tells us that he wants us to do something because our foundation is in Christ. We're born again. We're a new creation. Now he tells us in verse 22 to put off the old self. Because the old self is still here. He says, put it off. This word put off is used a lot in the New Testament. Some of these scriptures that uh, are saying the same thing. In Colossians 3, 9, and 10, it says to put off 
it says we've already put off, seeing that you have put off the old self. So it's something that already happened. It's something that happened the moment we were saved. The old self was put to death. We don't have to respond to it anymore. But then the old self is powerless, but we can bring it back to life and let it rule in our life. So here in Ephesians, it's saying, put off the old self. In Colossians 3.9, it says, seeing that you have put off the old self with all of its practices, all of its ways of living. And so truth and the sinful nature is dead. That is true. In uh, Romans chapter 6, it explains how the sinful nature has been put off. It is dead, but we need to reckon it so. We need to consider it so. We need to really believe that it's actually happened. So uh, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, if we have been united with him in death, and so, so we are, uh, we shall certainly be united with him in the resurrection. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin would be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved by it. He that sins is the servant of sin. That's why so many people are hooked on things they're not supposed to be, hooked on things that are destroying them, how they're uh, taking drugs or drinking too much alcohol or having uh, too much bad behavior with their anger or whatever that's destroying them. Because when you sin, you're a slave to it and you have to keep sinning. If you've ever been... Um, where you had to drink all the time or take drugs all the time, you understand that. Or have you had a, a situation where you just have to eat all the time? Uh, then you've, you understand what it means to be enslaved to sin. And then he says in verse 7, For the one who has died has been set free from sin. That's the glorious thing, that Christ died, we died to that sin, and we can be set free. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, he will never die again. Death is no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now he says this in verse 11. So also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's the learning process that we have to understand that we are dead to our sin and that we can be alive to God in Christ Jesus. And in verse 12, don't let sin reign in your mortal body to make it obey its passions. The passions are still there. He's saying don't let that happen. Put it off. Like an old garment, take it off and put on a new garment. We don't live that way anymore. Don't present the members of your body, my hands, my feet, my brain, my mouth, my eyes, my ears. Don't present the parts of your body as instruments for unrighteousness, but instead, we're putting off the old. Now, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought forth from death to life, and your members to God. Present yourself to God as instruments of unrighteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. I remember times in my own life when I would drink, and if a, a Christian would come to the door or phone me up, and, and I knew who it was. When I was drinking, I wouldn't answer. For one, I didn't want people to see how messed up I was. <laughs> And another thing is, is that I didn't want to stop drinking. Or they would say, well, call me when you feel the temptation. And I would say, when I feel the temptation, you're the last person I will call. Because I want to do it. The sin nature wants to. But I, you find over the time the truth in Jesus Christ that we really are dead to, the sin, to our sin. And we don't have to do what it says. We can do what is right. And in fact, uh, to have a drinking problem, you can never drink again. You can never do drugs again. You can never watch porno again. You, you can never be enslaved to your sin again. 
In Christ, we have that possibility and a very real reality. It's very true. Don't let sin have dominion over you. We don't have to. We've been delivered from all of that. The Bible says to put off your old sinful nature. It's like putting off dirty clothes. In Romans 13, 12, it says, put aside the deeds of darkness. Put them away. They're deeds of darkness. You don't do those anymore. In Colossians 3, 8, it says, in these two, all these sins we used to live. But now you must put them all away. And then it has a whole list of sins to put away and stop doing. And Hebrews 12, 1 said, says, let us also lay aside every weight and put them all away. And then it lists a bunch of sins. Don't do these anymore. And then James it says, put away all filthiness. Uh, Peter says, put away all malice, and then, then a whole list of sins. So you get the idea that God wants us to get this. He wants us to learn this. He keeps telling us throughout the New Testament, just put all the sin away. It's like putting on new clothes. You've got old, raggedy, uh, holy, dirty, filthy clothes on. Put them away and put new clothes on. Because what we're wearing can make a huge difference. And how people see us. Do people see our old life or they see the new one? One time uh, when I was working in security at Harris, I was walking down the hallway that empties out into the parking lot. And this um, very attractive lady was walking towards me. She had like a fishing tackle box in her hand. That's the way I looked to me. And when she got up to me, she was looking at me and smiling. And she said something to the effect, well, that was, that was really a good day. And I said, well, yeah, today's, today's an okay day. And she says, you don't recognize me, do you? And I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't. And she said, um, we spent a lot of hours together today. Whoa, you, no way. <laughs> well, I, I had worked a convention and at the convention, they had one of the showgirls there. We called them the chicken lady because they were yellow like a chicken kind of. And they had all these feathers and stuff and these huge things on their head. And they looked like chickens to the employees. And we called them the chicken lady. And uh, I was there doing security for that. So me and her, were work she was greeting all the guests when they came in. And I was making sure the guests were who they were supposed to be. And we were there for hours. And um, I went... You're her. And she said, yeah. She said, without my makeup on and my costume, she was a whole different person. She, was, she put her old clothes away and she put on her new clothes. And uh, I thought she was prettier without all the stuff on. Then that little kit, that was all of her makeup. She had to put it in a box and carry it like a fishing tackle box. There was so much stuff in there. It looked like you could write your initials in her cheek when she had all that stuff on. And uh, her eyes were about this big, but they're really, you know, normal. All the makeup. So we can take off those old clothes and we can be a new person in Christ who he wants us to be. And that's all he's saying there. Take off the old clothes, put on the new ones. Let the old life go. And, and all of these, um, these parts of speech, uh, put off the old and put on the new, what they are, they're, they're present tense verbs. That means something just keeps going on. It doesn't end. So our whole Christian life, we keep changing. We keep growing. And sometimes we don't change and sometimes we don't grow. We just become stagnant. And a Christian can't become stagnant. A Christian goes backwards. When you start reading the Word of God, when you start letting God work in your life and you don't pray to Him and spend time with Him, we start going backwards and, and regressing. Um, the last time I rode a motorcycle was in the 1970s in Detroit, Michigan. And it was my friend's motorcycle and it was a racing bike. And we took it out into a field. He had just gotten it. He was going to turn it into a street bike. And uh, he really wanted me to ride it, and I didn't like motorcycles, but I wanted to make him happy about his new motorcycle. So I got on it, and I, I tried to take off real slow because I'd never ridden a whole lot of them, and, and then it just died. 
And then he, he couldn't start it. He didn't have a starter. He had to push it. So he was pushing me all over this field, and the thing kept dying. And he said, it's a racing bike. It has to go up or it has to go down. That's all it does is go up and down, fast and slow. You can't just hold it steady. And that's the way the Christian life is. You, you can't hold it steady. You're either going up or you're going down. So I said, okay, I'll give it a little gas. So when I gave it a little gas, it stood up like this. Now I was on one wheel, and when it went like this, my wrist bent like that, and it even went more. And I just jumped off it, and I hit the ground, and I'm watching this bike go down the trail on one wheel, and then it finally crashed. And that was the last time I rode a motorcycle. But that's the way our Christian life is. You have to go up or down. You can't just go steady. Now hopefully we won't crash. Years ago, Chuck Swindoll, back in the 70s or something, wrote a book called Three Steps Forward, but then Two Steps Back. And our Christian life is like that. We, we gain a little bit, but then we just get discouraged and we lose. And, but the thing is, we don't stop going forward. Every time we get discouraged, every time we sin, or things don't go right, and maybe it's our fault, Satan comes along and says, that's it, you are worthless, you are, you are no good. Well, when we were serving him, that was true, but not anymore, not as Christians. We can keep going. We keep progressing. We keep changing and, and trying to tell uh, my kids that you can change. And they say it's impossible. I say, no, it's not. Because I remember Ada L. Peck, and it's not impossible. I, I don't have to be in the principal's office. I can change, and you can change too. So, um, so the old self, we put the old self away, and we put the new self on. And that's, that's why Christ came, so that our lives would change and be righteous and holy, to follow Jesus Christ. And now he says, uh, you put on, the, you get rid of the old self. Now he says in verse 23, I want you to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. Which was supposed to change our minds. And, and some of us, we came to Christ later in life, we have a whole lifetime of wrong thinking in our minds. And God says, change it, be renewed. And how do we do that? All of the renewing is in this book. This is where it all is. And this is where we learn how to be set free from our sin and how much God loves us and, and can empower us to be free from our sin. So Paul had this wonderful example like we talked about. He says, I thank God who has given me the strength Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful and pointed me to service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent opponent, he knows what he was and he isn't afraid to talk about it and tell. But he said, God made me a minister. He made me an apostle to the whole Gentile world. And, and he made me someone that can write scripture. When I read... Uh, a few days ago, I read the story of Jericho and the spies that went there to spy it out when the people of Israel, after 40 years, are getting ready to go into the land. And the spies went to a prostitute's house, probably so they wouldn't be noticed. Uh, you know, that would be a place where they expect men to go. So it turns out the prostitute said, I heard about what your God did at the Red Sea. And I heard about what he did to those two kings and all of the people here hurt and they are deathly afraid of you. And so I have come to the conclusion that your God is the actual God that created the heavens and the earth. And I want to please him now. I want to follow him. So this prostitute in a pagan city, a very evil city at an evil time, that God said, they're so evil, I want you to wipe them all out. This one lady said, I realize that your God is the real one, and I'm going to follow him. Would you please save me and my family? And God did. And her name is listed in the line of Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew, there she is. Rahab, the harlot. Because God is in the business of changing people. 
And no matter how bad we are, he can change us. And no matter how many defeats we have, he can change us. We, he wants us to renew our minds over and over and over. It's a, once again a present tense. Keep renewing our minds by what God says in his word. And then he says we're to put on the new self. And the new self is created in the likeness of God. And our old self isn't. <laughs> It's created in the likeness of sinful Satan, sinful, evil, murderous, lying Satan. The new self is created in the image of God. One of my favorite uh, verses is um, 2 Corinthians 5.17. We're new creatures in Christ. We're new creations. When the Holy Spirit comes in at salvation, he does something invisible. He creates a new us. So we can be a, a new us. That's what God does for us. He gives us everything we need to walk the Christian life. And it's all created after him. Uh, we are created in Jesus Christ for good works, it says in Ephesians 2.10. It says we're not saved by good works in Ephesians 2.8 and 9. But then it says we're created for good works once we get saved. That's what he wants from us. And we do good when we're doing good works, we're being changed. We're, we're being a new person in Christ. So, uh, I, and we're also created to be righteous, and we're created to be holy. You shall be holy, for I am holy. And, and I think that's what most people don't like. They don't want to come to God because they don't want to give up their unrighteousness. He came... Um, to his own, and his own didn't receive him. He was the light of the world, but they didn't want light. They wanted to continue in their darkness because their deeds were evil. But for us as believers, Christ lives in us. Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. That's the work he did when we're saved. The old nature, the old man is put to death. And then he says, it's no longer I, it's no longer me in my sinful nature, it's no longer me who live, but now Christ lives in me. He was perfect. He was the righteous one. He was the one that loved everybody. He was the one that stopped at a well and said to his disciples, we have to go through Samaria because I want to talk to a woman. He didn't tell them that then, but if he would have, they would have gone, what? You, you kidding and he said, I want to talk to a Samaritan woman. Double what? Double your kidding. You know, he sent him off into the city to buy some food. And he said to the woman at the well, he came there to talk to her. She said, you're talking to me, a Samaritan and a woman? Jesus said, yeah, you, you mean something to me. And I want you to learn the way of salvation. And when she realized that he was the Messiah, she ran into town just yelling, the Messiah's here. He told me everything about my whole life, my whole terrible five-husband life. <laughs> and then the whole town went out, and the whole town says, heard Jesus, and the whole town came to the Lord. He wants people to be saved, and he wants us to be changed. And he wants Christ himself. He wants him to live inside of us. And the life that I now live in my body, all the rest of my days till I die or get taken away, I live by faith in the Son of God because he loves me and he gave himself for me. And I can share that with other people so that they can be saved, so that they can be free. It's so sad seeing this world uh, so deathly afraid of, of an illness and dying. I don't want to die anytime soon. I don't want to die anytime later. <laughs> but I know what happens when I die. As Christians say, we just don't want it to hurt. <laughs> we want to fall asleep and all of a sudden wake up in heaven or something. But we're not afraid of death. So this whole COVID thing, we don't have to be afraid of death. There's still people deathly afraid of death. And the Bible says they spend the whole lives being fearful of death. And, and they're the ones that are going around in a car all by themselves or walking in a lonely trail all by themselves wearing something on their face. Uh, that doesn't help them, that actually makes them more sick. 
because they're breathing their own exhaust and all this on and on. We don't have to be afraid of death. What we need to be concerned about is the death of our old nature. That's what we need to be concerned about. But Christ can live in us. We serve a God that loves us and gave himself for us. And he wants us to be righteous and holy. And that's the message in this passage. And that's the message for today. And then uh, following this, next week, it has all these things to do. It says, okay, now you've died to the flesh. Now I want you to stop lying to each other. Now I want you to stop stealing. Now I want you to stop being angry with each other. Now he tells us all the details of how to put off the old and then put on the new. And he ends up this chapter 4 in verse 32. He says, by the way, of the whole church, of every church was like this. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. That's putting off the old, and this is the new. That's the new we're supposed to put on. But a lot of problems happen in churches because people are living in their old nature, full of hatred and jealousy and envy and slander and all of that. So uh, now next week, if you thought this week was kind of invasive and whatever, wait till next week. He starts listing things. Uh, so let God do a work in our hearts. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your great patience with us and our, as our lives as we walk with you. And thank you for your great love uh, in sending Christ to die for us. And thank you for the possibility of change because you've given us a new nature and the Holy Spirit, yourself living inside of us. Lord, help us to learn and consider ourselves dead to sin but alive to you. Help us to learn these things from you and the truth of God and who we are and how we can therefore live. So we pray, Lord, that we will be victorious and, and a powerful group of people that can uh, not be afraid of this world, but to fear you in reverence and awe and then be bright shining lights and witnesses in this world. Uh, make us that, we pray, Lord God. And we submit ourselves to you and your wonder-working power in the name of Jesus, your son, amen.